Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon is a podcast which focuses on contemporary social and educational issues from an educational leadership and behavioral research perspective. We will delve into those issues that are important to you as we listen to understand the needs of others and positively respond to address those needs, concerns, and or fears. Professionals in their respective fields of expertise, in addition to friends of the podcast, will share their unique perspectives of positive solutions to what matters to you most. Join us every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central Time, as we share positive solutions to those issues that are important to you. Welcome to Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon. We are very fortunate to have with us today two special guests. We have two educators, one from the big island of St. Croix, United States Virgin Islands, Dr. Sally Camacho, who is an ESL, which stands for English as a Second Language Teacher at the John H. Woodson Junior High School on St. Croix. We also have Dr. Medalia Cruz Authorton, who is one of the coordinators over on our sister island of St. Thomas, United States Virgin Islands. And so before we get to meet these two wonderful ladies, let's pause for a second as we go into our fun trivia segment of our podcast. Do you know a whole lot of information that you would like to utilize in a fun and useful way? Or perhaps you like learning new fun facts, which can be used as conversation starters at a meal with a friend or while standing in a long line. The Ultimate Trivial Pursuit Question and Answer Book contains fun facts of sports and leisure, science and nature, arts and literature, history, entertainment, and geography. Test your skills with others every week as we begin our episodes with fun trivia. You'll be given six questions at the beginning of the podcast, and you will have the opportunity to post your correct answers to all six questions to Dr. Gordon Podcast One at gmail.com. The first person to post all six correct answers will have their names announced as the winner on the following episode. The person with the most wins after 50 episodes will win a gift certificate from our podcast's gift basket of tangible goodies. Who knows? Maybe you can win dinner for two at a restaurant in your area or enjoy a full body massage from a licensed health and fitness spa. Don't be bashful. Join the fun every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central Time on this podcast, Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon. Now go ahead and get a pen and a sheet of paper so that you can write down the questions and also your answers to the questions. You have an opportunity to then submit your correct answers to all six questions to Dr. Gordon Podcast One at gmail.com. Again, that's Dr. Gordon Podcast One at gmail.com. The first person who submits all six answers correctly to Dr. Gordon Podcast One at gmail.com will be the winner and have their name announced on our next episode. Don't forget, after 50, 5 zero, after 50 episodes, then you have an opportunity to win a tangible gift from our gift baskets of goodies. So let's get ready now with our six questions for our fun trivia segment. Do you have that pen and paper ready? All right, let's go. I'll say the questions twice, listen carefully, write them down, and make sure you have the correct answer. Here we go. Number one, what happened to the horse which Paul Revere rode on in his famous midnight ride? What happened to the horse that Paul Revere rode on in his famous midnight ride? Question number two. Which country was at war with Iran from 1980 to 1988? Which country was at war with Iran from 1980 to 1988? 
Now, for those of you who do play trivia, as you're thinking of those answers, uh, you probably are asking yourself the question, now, which category is being used right now? So we're going to take a look at the category of history. So if you haven't figured it out yet from our first two questions, we're dealing with the category of history. So we're going to move on down to question number three. What was the country of birth of Henry Kissinger? What was the country of birth of Henry Kissinger? Question number four. What fun-loving state boasts town names of Christmas, holiday, and panacea? What fun-loving state boasts names of Christmas, holiday, and panacea? Question number five. How many of King Henry VIII's wives were executed? That's not a fun question, at least not for those wives, but it's what's on the list of questions for this particular segment of history. So how many of King Henry VIII's wives were executed? And our last fun trivia question, number six, which ancient Roman buildings nighttime lighting is changed from white to gold when someone anywhere in the world has the death penalty commuted? That's a long question. I know. I'll say it again. Which ancient Roman building's nighttime lighting is changed from white to gold when someone anywhere in the world has the death penalty commuted. So go ahead and find those answers to those six questions. They all have to be correct and then submit them to Dr. Gordon Podcast one at gmail.com. Whoever's the first person that sends all six answers correctly to that email address, Dr. Gordon Podcast one at gmail.com will win the bragging rights of having the answers answered all correctly. So now let's get to meet our guests for today. You're listening to the podcast Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon, which is uploaded weekly on Sunday afternoons at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central on your favorite podcast directory. A very pleasant good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon. We are honored to have with us today two exceptionally great ladies in the Department of Education here on the island of St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands, Dr. Sally Camacho, and over on our sister island of St. Thomas, USVI, Dr. Medalia Cruz Authorton. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you thank for you, inviting us. For inviting us. <laughs> No, of course, absolutely. And um, both ladies are hardworking. As you can see, Dr. Arthur Chen has a whole lot of stuff behind her. It's not props. She actually is working, folks. And so, <laughs> and so she has a class to teach over um, the next what, hour or so at uh, the University of the Virgin Islands. So we're going to be respectful of her time and um, Go ahead and get started. And Dr. Camacho has been working all day teaching wonderful seventh and eighth graders uh, over at John H. Woodson Junior High School. And so she's tired. So I'm so thankful that both ladies have agreed to join us on our podcast. And um, so we know that September 15th to October 15th is known as Hispanic Heritage Month. 
Now, we also know that Hispanic heritage is not just for a month. So it's celebrated every single day of the year, but sometimes it's just taking off at this time to uh, focus on the accomplishments, the achievements, and to bring a recognition of Hispanic heritage and a lot of wonderful individuals who have done a lot in the nation, in the United States and around the world, of course, uh, who have Hispanic background or their roots are in Latin America and they've contributed so much to helping to make the world a much better place. And so both ladies are gonna share their perspectives of what uh, Hispanic heritage is, what they do, how they help others to understand what it is. Um, and before we get to that, I would like for my wonderful listening audience to get to know my guest. I had the privilege of getting to know these great ladies. So I want you to have the same opportunity to get to know them as well. And so, um, ladies, if you don't mind, just, you know, summarizing basically, you know, what it was like growing up and um, any challenges that you might have faced, what led you into education. And uh, I'll go ahead and start with um, Dr. Migdalia Cruz Authorton over in St. Thomas. Uh, share with us a little bit about yourself, your background. Well, um... Let me say this, Dr. Gordon, um, I am of Puerto Rican heritage, but I was born in the Bronx in New York. That's where I grew up, and that's where my parents met. Um, that's where I went to elementary school, junior high, and high school. Um, so I am a New Yorican, <laughs> as we call ourselves in New York. Um, my parents always thought of educating their children because they did not have that opportunity towards an education beyond an eighth grade at that time. So they put their all into educating my sister and myself. So I went in New York all the way up to the high school. And it was a time of civil unrest and you also had the Vietnam War coming in and so they decided after living so long in New York that it was time to take their girls to a quiet place a better place and they didn't want to stay in New York at that time it was very chaotic at the time uh, we are talking about the civil rights movement, Vietnam War protests, and um, a lot of things happening. We even had a blackout and all of that. And so they decided in 72, we're heading to Puerto Rico. And so um, in Puerto Rico, I went to the university. There I went and did my bachelor's degree. I'm an English major. And I- Kindred I'm, spirits, yes. <laughs> That's a kindred spirits because my major is also English. <laughs> yes. And I like to read. So I focus on American literature and British literature. But something told me I wanted to be a teacher um, and it was, I guess, because from small, I was always helping my cousins uh, with their assignments, um, practicing their spelling and so forth. And so when I was in college, I decided I'm not just going to study English. I am going to go into the education field. So I began taking the courses in education in Puerto Rico, you can do elementary and secondary and do the K-12 track. And so I'm certified both at the elementary level and the secondary level. But then after working one year, I said, no, I'm going back to the university. And I went and did my master's. So I have a guidance counseling degree, but I also have a teaching of English as a second language degree so I combined it and I came in 85 to St. Thomas 
I get married. <laughs> I was about to ask you so what I drew you to St. Thomas out of out of Puerto Rico. So, but you answered my question. <laughs> someone captured married. your someone captured your attention. All right, go ahead. <laughs> yes, yes. And so I came to St. Thomas, and I began working as a counselor for adult education. After working in adult education. Um, the commissioner back then was Linda Crickey. And that's I remember her. She invited me to her, uh, to her office to ask me why was I an adult ed with a background in teaching English as a second language and they needed a coordinator. So in 89, I became the first district coordinator for St. Thomas, St. John. I, I, I hear so, I hear a memoir in the making. <laughs> I have held this position for a long time, but in 2000, my husband looked at me and said, why don't you go for a doctorate? And I said, really? But he encouraged me and I did. And that's how I got my instructional leadership degree. Wonderful. And I'm still here. And the St. Thomas, St. John I district am. is better because of your work and your presence there. <laughs> I like helping my children. I call them my children. No, it, it shows because um, we've met in um, a number of trainings. Um, I remember a few years ago, um, the district would, uh, the mm -hmm. territory would have various trainings. And that's how we met um, through the ESL mm -hmm. uh, trainings there. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, wonderful background. But yeah, don't laugh about that memoir. I, I hear a memoir in the making. <laughs> Dr. Camacho, uh, <laughs> go for it. Hey. Dr. Camacho, so um, we heard about our New Yorkan from Dr. Medalia Cruz Atherton, yes. born in New York. And um, she's not like Jenny Bronx. from the block. Yeah. <laughs> and from the Bronx. From the Bronx, yeah. So, Dr. Camacho, how about you? Um, can you just summarize for us uh, a, little bit, a little bit about your background and um, how it led you to where you are today as an ESL teacher? Well, I got some interesting stories. Arthurton was my teacher in my <laughs> master's, but we'll get there. Oh, okay. Um, we'll get the I juicy was... details later. <laughs> yes. Well, I was also born and halfway raised in the Bronx, New York. So mm -hmm. I'm also New Yorkian. Um, <laughs> my parents are Puerto Ricans, but never taught us Spanish. Um, they were born in Puerto Rico, but they were raised in New York. So um, when I was 13, they decided, you know what, we're moving to Puerto Rico. And we went to live to Puerto Rico. And of course I go to school and I don't know a lick of Spanish. So my mom actually had to teach us Spanish and she would pull out the newspaper every day, every <laughs> afternoon and sit there and teach us Spanish. Um, the thing about it is that when I went to school, nobody was there to teach or to help or support, um, you know, there was no- there Was it any remember, ESL no or ESL, bilingual? No bilingual, nothing. It was wow. sink or swim. You either mm -hmm. get it or you don't. Wow. And my mom was determined that we were not going to fail. And the first thing that they told her was um, that we would be left back because we didn't know Spanish. And she said, no. I know how this works. No. <laughs> By the first test, they will know some Spanish to pass. They're, you're not going. And she fought it through. She fought through. She even, you know, she would volunteer. She would do whatever. But she said no. She always told us that our future is educated. You know, if we wanted a future, we wanted a better future, we had to be educated. And you know, I was one of those who I, I didn't like school because of that, because it was hard. 
And my brother, um, he, he was already in high school when we got to Puerto Rico, he was out the door, so he didn't worry too much. And <laughs> my other two siblings, um, they're very, they're, they were always honor roll students. I have to study. I'm not blessed with a photogenic memory, none of that. I actually had to study. So um, I really, you know, I really thought about, oh, I'll go to work instead of going to college. And my parents said, okay, no problem. They left the room, they came back and they said, here are the bills. And I mean, <laughs> what do you mean? You want to go to college? You have to pay these bills, so you have to get a job. And <laughs> me ignorantly said, oh, okay. And when I saw that first paycheck, not knowing how much taxes come out and all of this stuff, I said, oh, no, I'm going to college. <laughs> I'm going to college. Don't worry. So that didn't take too much longer. Um, but the good thing is that when I went to get my bachelor's degree, um, my professor, Greg Barge, he was instrumental in me really grasping the grammar and Spanish and learning because he took me under his wing and he would hear me talk and he said, you know what, Sally, if I translate every word you say, it sounds perfect in English, but in Spanish, it makes no sense. Right. <laughs> so yes. he it's all over the place. Me and um, I didn't know what I wanted to study. Um, and, you know, through my guidance counselors and him, you know, they recommended technology because I was good at that. And, um, and teaching and I at ESOL, I said, when I first started, I really didn't know what it was about because I never got that help, right? So I didn't know any better. And so when I saw what it was all about, I said, no, nope, this is what I'm doing because I don't want other kids to struggle the way I had to struggle. And so my career has been there. And then I moved to St. Croix and, uh, I think it was two years later, I was blessed with being able to um, study my master's. Um, the Department of Education paid 20 people to get their master's. And I was one of those people. So that was that was a blessing. Um, that was in ESL? Was of, yes, bilingual yeah. education. Right. And not everybody has the money to invest in, in, in higher education and all of that. Right. Um, and one of my professors was, <laughs> yes, Dr. Atherton. So I was very young. I was in my twenties. Yes. Um, and you know, there was a lot of learning and growing, yeah. um, but I did it. And then I moved to Florida mm -hmm. and in Florida, um, I went and, um, got a reading endorsement. Um, so I did my reading endorsement thinking that I could help. I became a coach and I can help teachers not only teach reading, but teach reading to our kids, to the ESOL population. Right. Um, because that's where the struggle is. People not knowing how to deal with our children. So I felt like the more I learn, the more I improve, the better I can help and support. And so I did that. I was in Florida for 10 years. Um, my husband is from St. Croix, so I went back to St. Croix, and after a couple of years here, I decided, let me go for my PhD in ESOL. I did um, in education, and I specialize in ESOL, and it's been great since, you know. I, I'm happy that I've done it because I learned that there's no reason why our kids have to struggle to learn. Right. Mm -hmm. And if we are prepared to teach them, then they will learn. Yeah. And um, so, and during this wonderful month, not only is it exciting to be able to work with this population, but also to celebrate them. And so yeah. I'm glad we are having this, this um, podcast in a month where we actually 
celebrate them. So absolutely, and, and I want to add. No, thanks to both of you for those wonderful stories that you have shared. We each have a story to share, and your lived experiences have been used to help to guide and uh, assist other individuals because you knew what it was like you struggled when you were trying to learn spanish uh you knew the struggles that you encountered and you decided you know what i want to see how i can help make someone else's life better so i'm going to become a teacher and i'm going to study the very thing that i struggled with and you've been a phenomenal teacher because I've had the opportunity and the privilege of also observing your class and um, to see your work and your worth. And um, so both of you are up there along the greats of uh, Hispanics who have contributed to helping to make the world a little bit better than how you met it based upon your past experiences. And that's what we each need to do. We need to take our profession, our talents, our gifts, and see how we can use it as a platform to help other people. And both, both of you have done a tremendous job at that. And I see a lot of similarities there as well, because you also had uh, great husbands in your lives that helped to support you. Um, they didn't say, no, you, you can't. They said, hey, no, they pushed you forward. And uh, she had that support. And you also had parents. You had a, a support mm -hmm. network, starting with your parents who said, education is important it's vital you're going to learn because it's going to take you very far in life and you're not dependent upon anyone uh, you're already starting off at a deficit based upon unfortunately the mindset of some people with regards to other ethnicities and so they knew that arming you with education would help to secure your future and now you're passing that gift on to students so kudos to both of you uh, for doing so uh, Dr. Otherton, uh, how did you learn Spanish? I know Dr. Camacho mentioned that she didn't know a lick of Spanish. Um, that's a little Caribbean expression to my stateside friends by, by saying a lick of Spanish. She didn't know a word in Spanish until she was 13 and her uh, mom helped her in learning it. And, uh, and so now she's able to speak the language. But um, did your parents, Dr. Otherton, uh, speak both languages in the house growing up? No, no. My mother only spoke Spanish. <laughs> And if you said anything in English, she'd tell you, how do you say that in Spanish? <laughs> so she kept it all in Spanish. My father had been in the 65th Infantry of Puerto Rico. So he was an okay. army sergeant. And so he knew English, but he followed her lead um, in the house Spanish. So if I was outside the house, that was my English world. But inside okay. the house, everything had to be in Spanish. But it brought me to be able to work in both languages, um, not only learn to speak it, but be able to read. And since I'm an avid reader, I grab anything that falls into my hand, whether it's English or Spanish. Right. Um, um, I know some people said that uh, if you listen to uh, your telenovelas <laughs> or the news in Spanish, <laughs> you will learn it <laughs> or read the newspaper. Yeah, I just, I just as, a, as a caution, though, for those who are listening, um, the telenovelas are a bit too uh, dramatic for my taste, but. Um, <laughs> yes, and they are. <laughs> I don't, I never, that was one thing I never liked. No, I, I hear you. Um, you know, my former wife, she's deceased now, but she was from Puerto Rico. She was from Caguas, Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, she used to like to listen to that. And I, my major was English in college. Mm -hmm. My minor was Spanish. Um, I, I changed mm -hmm. from Spanish to another minor my last year of college, but Spanish all along was my minor. And then I taught Spanish when I returned to St. Croix. I taught uh, Spanish one and Spanish two. And um, mm -hmm. I didn't become as fluent in it until I, uh, was married and then because she was limited in speaking English it just made sense to say you know what to speak Spanish and so I yeah. gained confidence in speaking it and so it's now at the point where it's conversational I won't defend you in court speaking Spanish but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the guy to call on to translate uh -huh. but um, but no I am able to help parents and also students who 
uh, mm -hmm. are in school and they need someone to translate it as a situation or if they need mm -hmm. some assistance. And so um, sometimes I'm calling upon by some teachers if they're sitting in an IEP, Individualized Education Plan for my listeners, uh, for those students who are in the special education, whose parent might be uh, Hispanic and are not having English as their first language. So I would help to translate there. Um, but yeah, it's like I used to tell my students when I taught it, you know, you never know what the future might hold. You might have uh, equal uh, qualifications, but because you are bilingual, you're able to speak another language, you're able to be used better by that corporation, that company, that business, um, you're an asset to them and you are placed in a better position to help other people. So it's very important. That is awesome. I, I love those stories. And Dr. Camacho, I hear a memoir coming on there for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not she's shaking her head. <laughs> so as we as we work as educators in the school districts uh, where we are, uh, how do we uh, help to support students uh, who are in our schools or in our classes? How does um, the bilingual education program, just in general, uh, work over on our sister island of St. Thomas? Uh, how does that look like? And then over on St. Croix, how? What is the main focus of our ESL? And ESL uh, means English as a second language uh, for my listening audience. And we have so many different acronyms in education. So uh, as educators, we just throw around these acronyms back and forth. But I want to be mindful that I, I take the time to explain uh, some of these different abbreviations. So ESL means English as a second language. We have a number of individuals or students coming to us from the islands of Puerto Rico, which is like 30 minutes away from St. Croix uh, and uh, St. Thomas, maybe a little bit more, and uh, mm -hmm. also from the Dominican Republic. And so we provide services to our students who may not have English as their first language. And so we have wonderful yeah. individuals. Issues. Yes, it's uh, for those who are listening, it's raining over here. So the internet connectivity might oh. be a bit spotty. Yeah. So how do we work to help our students and also our parents in the we lost them we lost no, them no i'm still here oh, oh okay i'm You're still here <laughs> okay I, i'm like still frozen. here Right. So for those listening, again, it's uh, we're having some weather here. Uh, it's raining and it's overcast. And so our signal is a bit spotty. So what I was saying was that how do we uh, help parents and also students who are in the uh, bilingual education program, also known as English as a Second Language program? So Dr. Arthur, I can start with you. Uh, what does it look like over in St. Thomas and the St. John School District? Um. Right now, we have only two schools without an ESL program, without teachers. Majority of the schools in St. Thomas and St. John have a program. So right now, we actually have 26 teachers working in the program. Our numbers are going up. And right now, um, looking at my elevation numbers, we're at 995. 995 um, students? Yes. Wow. K to 12. Yes. It, wow. It's jumped. Jumped over the month. And so the purpose then is to have teachers who are trained in ESL, uh, in English, of course, the four content areas, English, math, science, social studies, so that those students uh, whose language is another language other than English can receive that support that they need to be successful in school. Is that correct? In our junior high, we have um, the ESL teachers in the content areas. At the elementary, we are using a combination depending on the facilities with the consolidation of um, pull out or push in. And we do have some schools that have self-contained Right. And so for those listening, can you explain what does pull out and push in mean in providing oh, services to our yeah. students? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm still here. I can see you and I can hear you. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I was, I was just asking you, for those who may not know, what does pull out and push in mean in providing services to students with ESL? 
uh, pull out with me that the children will go to the teacher and she will work with the students. Um, push in means that the teacher is coming into the classroom and working in that classroom with that regular teacher while the student is in math or science and so forth. Okay. Um, we also have um, schools that maintain a self-contained classroom. And so they work with the students in the classroom, the entire group, but they come out and they'll go to, if there's an ESL math teacher, they'll go to that math teacher. Okay. But that English class is self-contained and the reading is done with that ESL teacher. Right, and thank you for that explanation. And Dr. Camacho, uh, the ultimate goal for the English as a second language, the bilingual education program in our schools is not for them to remain in that self-contained. What is our goal uh, for ESL? For students coming into our school districts? Well, our goal is that our students um, become proficient in the English language. So we do not have bilingual education anymore. We only have ESOL. Um, so the program, just like Dr. Arthur mentioned, could be different but the purpose is always the same, the same, is to build their proficiency. And mm -hmm. how we build their proficiency. Um, for example, in my case, um, I'm in middle school. Um, we had last year where the, we had the English, um, the language arts teacher teach the ESO students using strategies um, that would support their learning. And I, as the ESL teacher, would um, provide services additional to that. Um, this year it looks different. This year I am serving in both capacities. I am the language arts teacher, but also their ESL teacher. So my job is not only to give them the material at the grade level, but to support them so that by the end of the day, they understand exactly these concepts that they need to know um, in the English language. Um, so that support can be through graphic organizers, a lot of visual aids, um, modeling, modeling, modeling. I, 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 I don't get tired of telling my teachers anything that you wanna teach any child because it's best practices at the end of the day is that you model, you show them what is it that they need to learn. Yeah. Um, so it takes a lot of work. There's a lot of preparation. Um, there's a lot of uh, visual and a lot of concrete and, 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 and things that they can use to learn. But um, at the end of the day, they will learn. And the stronger they are in their first language, the better and the much quicker they can transfer that information to the English language. And at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want them to keep their language, but now add, right? Have them transfer that main language to the English, having a proficiency that would allow them to be successful. And not, a, not mm -hmm. only in their daily conversation because they get that on their own, um, but we want them to academically be strong and successful so they can go to college and they can read um, a college textbook and, and they're able to understand and comprehend and write just like anyone else. So, um, yeah. and I am a true picture of what that means to learn that <laughs> second language, but because my first language was strong, I was able to make that transfer um, to my second language, which is Spanish. And, you know, um, that's our goal. Our goal is for them to be academically successful in right. the English language. <clears throat> right. And also while supporting their own native language of um, Spanish, their mother tongue. Um, we don't want them to neglect that. So I know on the high school level, 
um, the goal. Yes, is for them to be able to be successful, and success is defined as uh, being able to read and to write in English, to comprehend, to understand, and uh, in English as well as in Spanish. And uh, we try to, if they come to us early on, like in the ninth grade, by their senior year, we're hoping to have them enrolled in the general education English classes with their peers. Uh, so that's a, a true test of um, that growth uh, and success that we're hoping to see on the high school level. And of course, the, AES, the ESL teachers are there to still provide support to the students, even though they might be in a general education class, regular English class with their peers, the ESL teacher is still there um, just to make sure that uh, they're staying on track and understanding yeah. the material. And um, I, I know that in the St. Croix District, they're doing a phenomenal job. And over in St. Thomas, you have Dr. Cruz, Vidalia Cruz Atherton, and she's doing a fantastic job over there as well. I haven't visited the schools there to see that, but uh, based upon talking to the teachers and the different trainings that we have, I, I, I witnessed that. So what on earth is Hispanic Heritage Month for someone who has never heard that before? And again, we have this um, podcast is not only for St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John, this is worldwide. <laughs> so yeah. folks, this spans um, the zip codes, it spans time zones. I have friends all over the place, uh, as far mm -hmm. as Australia, uh, Europe. Um, it's fun looking at the stats in in, um, in podcasts. I'm like, my goodness, there are people in France listening to this, really? No, they're just saying that to make me try and feel good. But there are people all, are, that are all over uh, listening to this. So what is Hispanic Heritage Month? Maybe there's a country that might be listening to this podcast and they have no idea what it is this is when we um tend to kind of stop and focus on the heritage of our hispanic children um this is when we highlight um hispanics who have contributed to the community yeah. um, we celebrate them uh, we recognize what they have done um, and we look at cultures also. We highlight the different cultures. Um, sometimes we tend to think, oh, I am from Puerto Rico. I am from the Dominican Republic, but we are more similar than we are different. Right. Um, I may come from Venezuela. I may come from Honduras, but there are similarities in our cultures. So we look at the cultures and highlight that aspect of the culture that's the same and if there's a, a dish that's different we we mention it a dance that's different we highlight the dances um whatever that culture can give and demonstrate that's what we do during that september 15th to october 15th sometimes we go a little over <laughs> because sometimes it depends on what the schools are doing and how they can schedule activities. But it's basically that time where we stop and look at our heritage. How are we showing it? What are we showing? And we have a conversation. So how do schools now, recognize and celebrate Dr. Camacho? Um, well, we celebrate it in many ways. This year is kind of hard. Right. Everything is online, but I uh -huh. wanted to mention this year's theme is be proud of your past and embrace the future, future. right? And so I took it um, upon myself to, for my classes to present the theme and different PowerPoints and um, in my um, class rooms, I I had the kids research about their names, where their names mm -hmm. came from. And um, as part of celebrating the culture and who they are. And it was so mm -hmm. interesting to see the amount of information and family and um, their heritage, you know, their mm -hmm. name means so much. So that mm -hmm. was awesome. So many ways we, you know, it's always about the end of the month is about the food. Let, yes. let, let's and this yes. year, I, I know that several of us over here in St. Croix are suffering because we don't have any luncheon. Um, but that's how we usually mm -hmm. end it up. I put some pictures because in the past, my kids have made um, 
either dolls that represent their their country, mm-hmm. their culture. Um, they do maracas. They make whatever represents. You know, I've had Mexicans. I've had from all these different places and they actually make instruments or dolls or things that represent their country. Mm -hmm. And it's awesome because, because it's a celebration of where they come from, they're willing to share and open up. So it's an awesome experience and it's an awesome month. So this year, everything is virtual. So all our makings are on camera on <laughs> the computer. Just warn them not to burn yeah. down the kitchen once they start to prepare the foods and get their parents' permission first. <laughs> yes. But you said something that was real that struck me very as very important, um, Dr. Camacho. You mentioned that um, you had your students to look up the meaning of their names. Normally we have the students to look at uh, a country, they can select either their country or pick any country that's of interest to them. And that's important. But uh, you started with themselves. Knowing your identity identity starts with knowing your name. What does your name mean? What does that say about yourself? And it also helps them to discover uh, who they are. And also it helps to build that self-efficacy within themselves, that they're special, that they're unique, that they're important that their lives matter and that um, they're not second class citizens they are worthy and so once we can teach our students that self-worth and self-respect no one can take that from them no matter what negative things that they may say or call them or refer to them as or their countries of origin and they can Mm -hmm. be bold and assertive to stand up and say that doesn't define who I am. And so knowing who you are is very important and helping to teach our students to recognize who they are and whose they are is very important, especially when you have individuals in positions of power that might tend to or try to disrespect them or their heritage. We need to train our, continue to train our students to be able to have pride in themselves first and in where they're from. So thank you so much for teaching that, passing that on to the students, knowing who they are by knowing their name, knowing their self-worth. So that, that is awesome. That's, that stood out to me. I mean, the arroz con pollo and habichuela is important too, but um, beyond the food, in addition to the food, is knowing who you are and having that self-respect. Go ahead, Dr. Camacho. Yes, they, and you know, also knowing where their name came from builds on their culture, their heritage. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of the parents, they come with their names because it came from other, you know, from their grandparents or mm-hmm. there was um, someone in, uh, something happened in the house or someone, um died that was of great you know importance for them or their names actually came from the bible they learned or there's so much and the actual conversation that they have with their families build on their you know build on that connection that they can make with their families so that is part of um positive right being positive being part of a family making those connections so that was important to me that they keep, you know, that family unit and conversation. And because our kids today, if you let them, they're all day on the phone or on the computer. And Mm -hmm. it's important that they need to come back to what family is all about, having that connection. Right. And that that is so important, what you have mentioned. And so one last quick question, then we have to let Dr. Arthurton go to teach her university (laughs) class. Uh, I'm watching the time, so I have five o'clock here. But... um, Thank you, know, you, Dr. Gordon. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it's very mindful of that. I like, yeah, yeah. I like yeah. the conversations we're having because I thought of a particular student that did his research on his name, and he did not realize that he carried his great grandfather's first name, uh-huh. the middle name of his grandfather. And then he discovered who they were and he didn't know who they were. So it made him then be proud of the names he was carrying. So he highlighted that when he had to narrate where his name was coming from, who was that person, what it meant to the family. 
So it, it, it did like a 360 degree turn on everything and put the puzzle together for him. And we as, as educators, as teachers, we get to help to mine those gold nuggets by leading our students to that self-realization. And so again, kudos to you, Dr. Authorton and Dr. Camacho for uh, what you have done and what you continue to do. Um, last quick question, um, right now, this is 2020, and um, by listening to the news and uh, viewing it on television, we're bombarded with the uh, amount of social unrest, um, the political divisiveness, economic uncertainty, and of course, there's the pandemic. How do we prepare our students for a world that we're living in today in 2020? And how do we support their parents who have to struggle to make ends meet? That's a tough one. That's a, that's a deep, thought-provoking one. Uh, um, let me say this. Um, my high schoolers, are the ones that tend to look at that all of this world we're living in and everything that's happening and i have gotten my teachers to get them to talk um i think it's important for them to let it out and not keep bottle it in when you bottle in things then you get angry and you get angry for the wrong reasons. Um, I try for them not to go and think that if I knock him down, I hit him over there, I solve the problem. No. So we have conversations of if something's bothering one student, okay, what's bothering you? Tell us and have conversations with the kids. Um, the teachers have been good at it because it has gotten them to understand, okay, that's happening because of this. So let's put everything in a particular place and let's break it down. Um, it has helped, really has helped. Now, in came COVID and regretfully, at the beginning, they had a little problem. Is this for real? What is this? But through conversations, through looking at what's happening to people who don't wear the mask, who don't wash their hands, don't sanitize, what it means. Um, we brought back the, through pictures and visuals and um, articles, the, the 2018 uh, pandemic and kind of gave them an idea of if you don't take care of, at that time, there was no medicine at this time. They're looking for something to help us, but you have to do some things. These are the things you have to do. Um, it's not an easy world. And so we're trying to get them to understand the world out there isn't easy, but you make your little place where it's good for you, where it's safe for you, your family. Um, and so we try to get them to think of those things. And so far, so good. <laughs> no, not, they, you know, curling into a little corner. No. Right. They're, they're, they're not being fearful. No. Yeah. And they're helping others. Yeah, and that, that's what it's all about. It's about, you know, finding, hence the name of the podcast, Positive Solutions. Yeah. If there's one yeah. solution, there are many other solutions. And yes, uh, one of the conversations, and I agree with you, Dr. Authorton, when you mentioned that you're teaching the students to be able to express their emotions that they're feeling. And one mm -hmm. of the things that uh, I would share with students is that, um, you know, that emotion of anger is not a negative thing. It's part of, you know, who you are. It, it, it's what you choose to do mm -hmm. with that anger. If you causing mm -hmm. damage to yourself or damage to property or to someone else then you know there's an issue and you need help that's the sign for help however channel that emotion of anger or fear or whatever that mm -hmm. emotion might be into something that's constructive and positive mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. whatever that situation is a little bit better so mm -hmm. dr camacho how how do you prepare the students and help to support parents in this world that we're living in of that social unrest and the political divisiveness the pandemic you know being quarantined at home just for safety how do we your thoughts on that well i have middle school students and the majority of my students are coming in 
um, from other countries. And so I think their, their main problems have been focused on the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I can see them struggling. They miss their friends. They miss being outside of their house. They, they, um, they, they miss just the daily lives. And some of our kids, we have to know that right now they're struggling with lack of food and parents yeah. who have to go work and leave them alone, being the babysitters of their little siblings. And there's a lot mm -hmm. going on. And, you know, so I try um, to build a friendship conversation. Um, I try to offer in that 55 minutes that I have them um, you know, an engaging, fun atmosphere where they can at least um, feel comfortable enough to to go back and say, okay, right now I don't have to worry about that. Um, so I have not, you know, being virtual is very hard to, to target so many needs that our kids have, but like Dr. Arthurton said, you know, conversation is important. Let them have a chance to talk. And so they do have a chance to talk because in my class, you know, I, I do a lot of oral language. But yes, all kids, it's about getting them to talk anyway, to build language. So um, they have time to talk. And depending on what they share, then I offer some solutions or, or some hope. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, the time that's left is to make their learning as happy and engaging as possible. Right. And uh, that's that's so important what you shared there, Dr. Camacho. And is that, is that hope that's needed to help to support our students and help teach them that hope as well so that they can know that it's not all is not lost. And um, hope mm -hmm. is what we need so that we're not falling, slipping into that slippery slope of depression and despair um, and disillusionment. So that is key what we are doing as educators. So ladies, I know it's time. And so would you be willing to come back at another time to talk about another topic? Maybe talk about virtual learning, what it's like. Um, it's, it's, it's that time I don't want to keep you any longer, but it, it's, it was great having you on the podcast and for sharing your thoughts, your insights on um, a little bit about your background and also on what Hispanic Heritage Month is and ESL and how it all fits into where we live today. So thank you so much. Would you be willing to come back on for at another time? Sure, Dr. Gordon. I would love that. That would be good. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for joining us on our podcast, ladies and gentlemen. That was Dr. Medalia Cruz Otherton from St. Thomas, United States, Virgin Islands, and Dr. Sally Camacho from the Big Island of St. Croix, USBI. Thank you, ladies, so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. You too, Dr. Gordon. Take care. Absolutely. Bye. Bye-bye. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Migdalia Cruz Otherton and also Dr. Sally Camacho. Uh, as you could tell, Dr. Otherton was uh, at her work spot uh, while we were doing the taping, the recording. And so she had uh, a couple of distractions there. So the noises in the background uh, was from uh, her at her work site. So we're just so thankful that uh, both ladies agreed to join us and share their insights of Hispanic Heritage Month and also what it's like to work as an educator in bilingual education, also known as ESL, English as a Second Language. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast, Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon. And remember, you have faith, you have hope, and you have love. Those are the three ingredients that we need to have a more harmonious society. But the greatest of those three is love. See you next time. Thank you for joining Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon as we learned about different perspectives of contemporary social and educational issues. We hope to educate and encourage as we analyze those topics that are important to you. Please continue to join us every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central as new episodes are uploaded on your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to subscribe by clicking on the link below this episode and respond to our fun trivia questions at drgordonpodcast1 at gmail.com. 
Remember, become that positive difference that creates a positive outcome in the lives of others as well as in your own life. See you next Sunday afternoon on Positive Solutions with Dr. Gordon.